All right. All right, guys. Welcome back to Ivan Peter Fitness Podcast. Today, I have Don Klein on the show. Um, Don has been somebody that um, has been you know wanting to come on for a while. Um, and I talked with um, my new coach, Joel Stanek, about him. And um, Joel told me that you know Don is wicked smart and has a lot of really unique programming ideas. Um, so I believe you are pre-med right now, actually. Yes, right? I am a pre-med major. Yes, I'm a major in, uh, well, my huge major is pre-med, but I'm also a major in bio, and then I'm a minor in neuroscience. Yeah, so uh, clearly uh, big brain hours over here. But um, Don is somebody who I, I think, you know, has a lot of interesting ideas that we could sort of talk about. And um, we really wanted to make this conversation a little bit more about creating a training microcycle and knowing how to, you know, adjust it for, for an athlete based off of certain pieces of feedback. But um, you're just, just talking about how I, uh, started with 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 Joe and how um a lot of my microcycle work is sort of front loaded um and I know that's something that Don has talked about on his, his social media so I want to uh, just give you the opportunity to like talk about like what that is okay so typically I use a front load uh, front loaded microcycle on someone who is very very poorly leveraged for a lift or um very tall so in your case the squat is uh probably the reason for the front loaded microcycle um that way we can offset a little bit of fatigue by not capping that secondary uh so that that secondary doesn't have to be a specific load it can sort of be a relative intensity load so you don't have to be very pinpoint on that secondary session if the primary precedes the secondary so um that's why typically you see a lot of uh, taller lifters running this model because there's a lot of fatigue that will, uh, due to larger limb lengths and longer limb lengths, they will carry more fatigue just due to uh, overall range of motion. Um, so typically I have a, a deadlifter on my roster. His name's Oliver. He uh, is front loaded on a three times frequency on deadlift um, just because he has a hinge day and a secondary day that is very high reps. He responds to a four by seven on deadlift, um, uh, which doesn't leak into the primary because it's front loaded. When we did a regular uh, microcycle model, which is Monday to Saturday uh, for like some baseline information, Monday to Saturday is your normal microcycle. Saturday uh, to uh, Saturday to Friday is an example of a front loaded microcycle. We ran two different models. And when he had a non front loaded microcycle, his adductors absolutely got shot the entire time. And when he didn't run a front, or when he did run a front loaded microcycle, it was just enough. He was feeling very poppy and very uh, ready into the session, and his uh, movement pattern was amazing coming into that session. Yeah, I think um, that's an interesting topic because, like, I never thought about like that being with, um, like, you know, like on a Saturday, which is like a Monday. It's so, like I kind of like somewhat on that, like my myself with, um, right. I used to put on um, like how my training start on Monday, and I'd go on um, primary bench or primary primary squat, primary bench, primary primary deadlift like monday tuesday um wednesday and i have all my secondaries like later on in the week but you're saying that um having it like on a saturday specifically like that changes the adaptation response well yes well having it on saturday is just an example just because it's the highest specificity when i front load a microcycle i usually always put it on saturday um unless their schedule is like you literally can't lift on saturday because i do coach some nurses um who just don't have availability on saturday just so that the specificity is highest going into comp just yeah, like how makes sense. there's uh, some people they like to deadlift before they squat and i'm like no you have to squat before you deadlift that's how you compete that's how we want to actually train yeah no I, i'd agree with, with, with that um but yeah I, I do i do think that's an interesting topic about you know how the range of motion affects is the different just like decisions with the microcycle and um like what you have to do in order to like make the lifter feel strongest on that secondary day because you wouldn't think that somebody with poorly leveraged would respond well to a high volume deadlift day um but that's actually like how i respond best on like looking back on my, my bench press the reason why joe and i are doing a five by ten super light before my primary day and seeing how that works because like my best training was when i was doing like a five by six really light before my, my, my primary day and that's kind of counterintuitive um because you would think that oh that's a lot of volume, but for some people, it just primes their, their primary days really well. Speaking of priming, um, that's something that I have a very, very unique uh, standpoint on. Uh, I, I kind of break priming into two types, uh, specifically on the bench press. I uh, view it as either musculature priming or uh, technique priming. So like yeah. the technique priming side, obviously you would go toward that like three, one, zero tempo bench just to make sure you have a very high arch uh, 
lifter who is in a very advantageous position, um, they can respond best to when their tech is always fresh. So like I'll often see if they are not primed going into the primary session that they'll actually uh, accumulate a lot more fatigue because they're in positions their body doesn't want to be in. So that's when I'll slap a technique primer into the days preceding either one day proceeding or 24 hours proceeding. I kind of have even messed around with uh, a lifter, Daniel Russo. He broke uh, the world record bench. Uh, he benches 12 hours before his actual primary bench because his technique needs to be dialed in. Um, if his technique is not dialed in, we'll see like his pecs are just extremely beat up coming into Monday. And we couldn't find out why until we added a technique primer in the form of like 65 to 69 percent uh volume bench uh just so he got more reps to work around like you were saying with uh joe's doing because uh that leads into my next point with musculature priming some people do better when they are under fatigue a little bit of fatigue not a ton of fatigue right. where they uh just get to a point where uh there's almost diminishing returns where they're just like oh i feel beat up but they keep performing they can feel beat up a little bit but when they are performing, I tend to do like a, uh, for higher range of motion ventures, uh, I tend to do more intensity based, very, very low reps, very high sets, like a five by two, five by one primer, just because um, they get to feel that weight in their hand. And that I typically do 48 hours previous to the primary session, because when I see this 24 hours, it's just too much for the actual uh, long range of motion presser to recover from. Yeah, so so basically, um, I that's something I've noticed on a lot of people where they like say I need to feel a little bit pumped is what I say with like the whole muscular priming. Um, like if, if my legs feel flat, for example, like I I don't squat well. Um, if my pecs feel like one hundred percent, I don't bench very well. But then my, my deadlift is like I need a lot of volume to for that to, to make to make progress. But we modify that by how close the deadlift to secondary day is to my primary day. Um, that is sort of how I respond um, but best to it. But um, I think that makes a lot of sense with the whole technique primers with just like want to make sense that you would need more time to just like re re recover if you're going higher intensity is because the nervous system takes longer to recover. Um, yeah. And then second off, um, you know, anybody that has a really, really high arch bench press or is just more dependent upon their technique versus the, the, the musculature. I think that's a really actually a great way to, to look at it um, because you can, you can really see that if they have like, if someone has a really technical base bench, well, maybe they probably need more technique practice and a technique primer make them feel strong. Whereas if someone has more of a muscular base bench, something that's a little more focused on that muscular system feeling good and feeling ready and feeling primed. Um, I think it's interesting we should do if we talk about that on deadlift, they'll be that's a lot less dependent upon like muscle and more so like what makes their technique feel good. And, and some people they just they get such a high fatigue fatigue response from, from deadlift that they do like anything above like say like five reps it's just it's super fatiguing and other people just if they go anything that's lower than that they feel really fatigued um i think deadlift is more about like technique than it's like like muscle in general so it's just finding like that rep range and that's just kind of how my, my model of downs that's work on deadlift is i want to find what makes their, their technique feel overall the best it puts them in the best positions because if i have somebody who's again like like triples but their back is hunched over and it's just, it's just too high you know, of, of intensity for them, for them to maintain their technique. I'll do lower intensities with higher reps. Yeah. So that's something that I've actually been playing around with recently uh, is the deadlift. Um, one thing that I've found for technique, if a lifter feels like the bar is very, very like light on the day, but their technique just looks actually awful is I've actually found that uh, the stimulus that, uh, beltless deadlifts and pause deadlifts give is actually very sim similar, um, especially with the position that the torso is in at uh, off of the floor because of no deadlift, the bar load is also lower. So the relative intensity that the person puts into that uh, set is pretty much equal to a pause deadlift. Um, and uh, the back routing problem I've found uh, beltless work has worked the best, uh, like just throughout my entire roster from female, male, lightweight, heavyweight, just because uh, I think there's a, a neurological uh, like wall people run into when they don't have a belt. Uh, like they literally just think they can't pick it up or like they or oftentimes lifters also uh, don't have a lot of core uh, strength because a lot, that's the number one thing that's neglected in powerlifting coaching is a lot of the core strength. So um, when I see pretty bad 
backgrounding technique or bad technique in general, my first thought is either pause deadlifts, but pause deadlifts when I have a huge deadlifter, like 700 plus objective pounds uh, on the bar, uh, oftentimes when they do a pause deadlift, the pause deadlift isn't a low enough uh, almost handicap for the lifter to uh, come into their primary refreshed. Because if you are pulling, obviously, seven plus hundred pounds, you're obviously a good technical deadlifter. So one thing with the pause or with the beltless de- uh, deadlift is it's kind of that cap that is needed to bridge into the primary. So that bar load stays pretty low. And then you could actually work on technique through cueing or even just spinal position with the deadlift. I think it's also like for myself, I've noticed that if I do beltless work, um, my hinging is better. And so if I did, you know, the belt kind of like gets in the way. Um, and I can have a hard time like just feeling out my, my position. That's actually like why I like on a, on remaining deadlifts or straight like deadlifts, I tell my athletes not to use a belt because it's it's much easier to hinge and get in that position without that belt in the way. Yeah. So the do you use an SPD belt? I think you do. Enzer. Okay. Um, the the huge thing I've been well for my non powerlifting America athletes, they have to use SPD. But the focal point of the belts, that huge buckle, is actually probably the reason why the hinge on some of my lifters, the conventional lifters, is so bad because the that focal point is so big, it almost biases you into a position. So then off of the floor, you're kind of your torso is a little bit more forward than you want it to be, and then at lockout, then you have to reposition yourself and expend more energy to actually lock the deadlift out rather than if you were to have a belt with a smaller hook or like a smaller lever um the focal point would be a little less like sticky and bungee um and you could get into a better position i've found with uh kind of medium leverage deadlifters not uh deadlifters that are super well leveraged for the lift they don't really get affected by focal uh focal points but when you're kind of like 50 50 good leverage versus bad leverage i found that the focal point of that huge spd belt is a, is a huge huge problem when it comes to programming or not even programming technique of the deadlift yeah um and, and that that scenario it's like you know maybe you just try going to the sumo the sumo tends to be a bit easier to create that space because you're generally more 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 upright or try modifying you know technique in some way maybe you're widening their, their stance but um you know, everything with the technique just comes down to um trade-offs we, we were talking about Something like that, but um, I wanted to, to mainly um talk about here. You know, you, you were talking about like one of your biggest strengths is programming and bench press, where you've had a couple of people who have yes. had um world records. Um, so I'll, and you wanted to specifically um talk about um certain pieces of lifter feedback that you use to re- sort of refine a microcycle. So my main piece that I use is the secondary to primary deadlift. Uh, kind of E1RM feedback has been the huge thing, um, but I only use it if the top set variation that I'm using, because the secondary day is actually where I apply my variations in the bench press. If the secondary day has a variation that is applicable to the primary day, so say it's like a two count. So I don't really think that two counts and comp bench are too big of a variation uh to not look at the data from the two count because sometimes you're in a competition and they have a longer pause. Um, so when I have a lifter with like a two count and then a comp bench on the primary, um, if that primary is really performing well, but I see that fatigue is accumulating throughout the block and uh, they are starting to like fizzle out via like the end of the block, it's probably due to the fact that they're pushing the secondary a little bit too hard. Um, my model is very sub max, uh, and I found that a oh, sub max on days other than secondary and primary, and a majority of my roster bench is four times a week. Uh, just because, in my opinion, there's four types of stimulus over the bench press there's a musculature stimulus, there's a technical stimulus, um, there's an intensity stimulus, and there's uh, there's an adaptation day that I, I kind of use, I kind of frame it as the adaptation day. It's basically the the bare minimum uh effective dosage that the lifter needs to perform on their secondary so i will almost prime the secondary um if i see a huge uh correlation between the secondary performance and the primary performance so say if i have a lifter who needs to hit uh let's just say an objective load of 180 kilos on their primary but they only can hit a 
and they only hit 167 and a half kilos on their secondary. And it just seems like it's too little, um, kind of like Marcellus's model where he goes off of the load of the week four to the week three. I kind of do that with the secondary and primary uh, bench models. So whatever the primary goal is, I'll go off of. I found the best to be between 82% to 88% on the secondary day of that week four, just because uh, I don't want to go too high, like 90 plus percent, because oftentimes when you have benchers who are benching 300 to 400 pounds, they're not going to recover in time for uh, Saturday. Like the often the exposure window is usually Wednesday to Saturday, Wednesday being the secondary and Saturday being the primary. And then the huge stimulus that I probably is very weird in my head i use musculature stimulus a lot uh based on a lot of my day one ventures just because i feel like they need to um in terms start the microcycle primed uh for the best performance possible throughout the entire time because i feel like there are lifters who perform uh the first half of the microcycle and then they just fizzle out the second half i don't know if you found the same i have yeah, and that's like in my in my model, I look at it a little bit like um two primary days. Um, it's like we were, we were saying like the whole like you know I'm at like it's like in my mind like if you're having like two sort of top sets throughout your week, and in some way that that's that's another primary day because you're getting another intensity stimulus, especially if it's more more drawn out. Um, because that just tells me that they detrain um shorter, and then their microcycle is probably three or four days instead of actually of seven days. Yeah, and well, the huge thing uh, in my entire bench system is I actually use the primary day backdowns for what they need to work on the most. So uh, in my whole system, it is, so if it's Monday to Saturday, all of the work up until Saturday's top set is meant to make Saturday's top set feel strongest. And then after the Saturday's top set has performed, um, I use the back downs to work on whatever that lifter needs to work on the most. So if it's just 10, like younger lifters, general hypertrophy, I'll give them a higher rep, higher rep, higher set. They need more musculature. So I'm going to try and either uh, give them an incline barbell or um, just high rep competition bench press will help build musculature. It's not the best way to build uh, musculature, but it does help if you're on a time crunch. Um, but if I see a lifter struggling at lockout, I will give them um, close grip or uh, even close grip incline to just help get them bigger, get the quicker efficiency to lockout. Um, and then there are a lot of things that are addressed through that last back down um, on the primary day, because I know a lot of coaches use it to prime the next week. I don't use it to prime the next week because I found that bench press is one of those things that it has high volatility if you are using the microcycle wrong. So that's why my day ones are almost meant to make the microcycle feel fresh again. So if lifters, if my lifters miss day one, they will feel very, very clunky coming into day two because their primary day backdowns are not meant for making everything feel the best. It's meant for whatever that lifter struggles with a lot pretty much musculature wise, usually, unless they're like a very, very big lifter. I do coach two lifters who have 500 plus dots. So for those lifters, I kind of uh, switch to a different, like a traditional model of using that uh, back downs to um, provide necessary stimulus to perform the next week. But for all of my lifters who are younger or don't have 500 dots, I will uh, use that there's two, three, four sets to work on something that they, they need to work on because I feel like if we use that work to just stimulate next week, eventually you're going to run into a wall because you can't repeat the cycle of coming in, stimulating, and then deloading, stimulating. It's just not effective, I've found, for bench press. So basically on down sets, it's like, so, you know, in one way, it's like, when would you do like lower reps then? Because like, it sounds to me like a lot of your work is more higher up for most of your guys. So, so a lot of my guys are uh, higher up models, but there are some people who t tend to respond to little to no fatigue. So they like to be in a more trained state all the time. So for those guys, I will do a lot like very, very, very low rep things, uh, but they'll obviously be, or sometimes be in ascending models or they will just be, uh, I use something called a fatigue stopper. So uh, if you're a Joe's right, model, this that, is yeah. who taught me. Um, so it is essentially you do a top set and then you do something with a mark set. So my typical model is one to four sets. And then it says, uh, 
like it's a drop set off of the uh top set and then i will just put in like rep till specific rpe and if the rpe is achieved with one to two sets um then that is okay but we don't want that day leaking into any of the other days of the microcycle because uh, when you respond to very low reps, it's going to be higher objective load. Um, just because obviously you can't push sixes as much as you push threes or twos or ones. Um, so that's why a lot of the, the lifters I find re respond best to lower rep days. I will use a fatigue stopper just because their fatigue is like their fatigue metrics are so volatile. Uh, I, I run into a lot of issues of under or over under recovery with lifters who respond best to lower rep work. Yeah, I think that makes sense because it's like, you know, you're, you're training so much more close to that, you know, quality that we are ultimately training for um, as powerlifters um, and, you know, really understanding that strength is really so multifaceted, you know, beyond that neurological um, stimulus. Like, and, and the reality is that like the volume, you, a lot of people need us to get stronger with that. It's super low. Um, I think that's like why, you know, when you mentioned you know, your, your volume, your model is just so sub max. Um, you know, that is really the entire way forward because, you know, we know that as long as there's a certain load, load threshold being used, which according to like the data driven strength guys, I believe they said it was about 70%, like a rep is a rep yes. for strength. And that's why a lot of times, like what I do with, with a lot of my newer guys when they come to me, there's a lot of powerlifters come to me with um, like, I'm sure you get this all the time too. It's like, I'm training really, really hard. I feel constantly fatigued and I'm always hurt. And then I usually yes. look at their volume and their intensity and usually they're not aligned. You know, they're trying to do everything hard all at once. You know, they're pushing a lot of accessories too. Um, and I basically strip it back down into like, okay, this is like more like a bare bones approach, but we're just trying to get like your, your fatigue in check. If you make some progress, that's great. Um, but we'll slowly like escalate volume as needed um, within my model. And so we sort of find the adaptation rate that, is predictable and expected. Um, now, obviously, knowing where to put that in, um, the microcycle is a topic in and of itself. For me personally, I try to sort of max out a primary day um, before I try yes. to do like a secondary day addition. Um, and that's sort of what I will do. Um, but the reality is that, you know, and this is something that I, I'm still like learning myself as like I've gotten more advanced because like, I've kind of like muscled my way to a 500 dots. Um, like my technique <laughs> isn't great on like really anything about like about my squat. Um, and I just kind of haven't really had to pay attention really to actual like low progression being like more like thought out. Um, but like, I, I think if you look at everybody at the top, um, other than John Happy, he's just you know, like, the, like, the ultimate outlier. Yes, he's, he's they're always, insane. they're always training super easy the majority of the time um, on paper. But like the interesting thing though, is Don is like, it still feels hard. Like, even though like, you know, that's a 500 pounds on deadlift, I know that you're, you're strong deadlift and squatter too. It's like, it still feels heavy. Um, and I think that yes. as long as you're applying that maximal like intent to your movement, like you're, you're, you're supposed to, you're going to be getting all the applications that you really, really want. And really ultimately at the end of the block is just like, if you're, if you're adapting, you're just going to be able to, it's not going to feel significantly harder from like a week one to like a week, to like a, a, like you know your expression week um but if you are not adapting then you know, that's like you know running running it back see like what was wrong with your overall like micro cycle um a lot of times it just is needing a little bit more volume well i found uh a lot of the lifters who end up like their week four to week one strength uh i always say that like uh I found on average that the RPE six on week four is probably close to your RPE seven to eight on your week one, just because that's the, the regular right. uh, adaptation rate of, of a person, which is if you use a basic general RPE, it'd be 6%. Obviously, Steve Denovi posted about that. Um, but I found when I find lifters that push too much almost uh, on their week ones, their week one to four is almost only three percent higher or on average or even like one and a half percent if they're a really really avid overshooter just because they don't want to to almost ad adopt a sub max uh sub maximal effort model because they like you said they like to push and push and push all the time and that kind of runs lifters down into the ground of fatigue debt like it's just to a point where there's so many diminishing returns on the uh week four 
because they kind of max out the dial of intensity. Because in my opinion, there's three dials uh, to powerlifting and two of which go kind of hand in hand. And that is volume and intensity. And then there's also the third, which is specificity. And when there's too much of intensity, uh, they kind of short themselves on volume. Because I find on average, when lifters come to me, they are like, I've been pushing my bench press super, super hard, either doing some sort of small love or some sort of Instagram program they found for cheap, which usually have some sort of uh, too much intensity, not enough volume. And that just, that's the recipe for injury. I, I think you found as well. Yeah. Um, just because like when lifters who are volume driven uh, find that they are pushing too much of the intensity dial and not enough of the volume dial, they actually won't make adaptations. They'll just stall out because they're not doing enough of the correct work. Because if I have a lifter like yourself and I give you like, ascending triples on deadlift but what's it going to do it's just going to stall you out on the secondary it might make the the bar feel really really light on the primary but you actually aren't going to make a lot of progress um i think you could probably say that from experience you probably try to model of lower reps yeah like the only time i did work was like when i was doing like two sumo days or like two like kind of conventional days uh, was when it worked out but like for me i found that my progress really took off my fatigue was better um when i could do two higher rep, rep days um with the alternating between single and, and conventional. Yeah. So the, the huge thing that I found is either you run into problems where you either bump up the frequency too much when you find a lifter who is always uh, trying to get the intensity dial too much, and then you don't pull the volume dial that, that well. Um, and that lifter sort of fizzles into, well, spirals down a either injury or they will regress due to the fact that they're not doing enough of the correct work. Um, and then another problem I find uh, is too much volume, not enough intensity. That's obviously very much uh, the bar feels very heavy, things like that, common feedback. But coming back to my point of the too much intensity, not enough volume, uh, that's pretty much the the hardest uh, problem solving I have had to do in my powerlifting career and I kind of have a, a weird way of solving it which is uh the I monitor the last back down so the last back down set that they do I will be like hell how did the bar feel here how did this feel um and if that bar is constantly feeling really really heavy as the back downs go uh as the back downs sets go on I will be like you might not be doing enough work because your your muscles might not be primed coming to the session they might be able to do the top set at a good RPE or a very, very accurate RPE to what I prescribed. And then they will be running into a spot of their ascending, their back down work is just kind of ascending an RPE. So I'm like, well, you don't have enough size or you are running into under recovery issues just because they want to do a lot of intensity and the intensity dial is, is, is a little bit too high to the point where they are almost over recovered uh, because they can't actually get the necessary work because the necessary work that they need to do when they're only pushing intensity would be so high of an RPE, they would actually fizzle out probably week one of a right. block. Right. Um, um, uh, another thing that I, I wanted to add to that was actually um, the the overall workload that the average lifter uh, on my team does uh, is, is pretty much based all around uh, the primary response just because over recovery versus under recovery is, is a good thing in, in it of itself because when the lifter's response is pointing toward over recovery symptoms I'll obviously bump up uh, I always go intensity first and then volume but when it's a longer range of motion lifter I will sort volume. of kind of break the mold because I find that well, yeah volume, longer range of motion, volume. I've, every single time it's volume yes. for them Yes, because for because something like me, if you add in things. another, if you add in like another top set or something like that, I just get worse on my top sets. Like every single 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 time, and with every single lifter, like I made that mistake of it's just like it's always just like it might it might feel good for like a day, but then like after that, they just it's just like they just they, they flatline at best, and then towards the end, they're going to like start to see this happen, and that's actually happened to me during my prep when I like back uh, earlier than this year. Well, if you were just doing too much of that top end intensity because um, my coach thought it was an intensity issue. 
Yes. So yes, that is actually the biggest thing I run into um, is not knowing when to turn that, that dial of intensity down and actually go to volume. And the only way that I've found to either feedback it out is uh, probably like calls. The, the biggest thing I do with my coach is I'll call a lifter for 10, 20, 30 minutes just because I have the availability to. Um, and the, the number one way I work through it is monitoring the average intensity or the, yes, the average intensity of each session. And if the average intensity is like insanely high over uh, Mike to, to, to share his model. I think um, like, I think an RPE five is like 76% in his model. And if I want that entire day to be an RPE five, and I'm seeing that it's like closer to a, a an intensity of like an RPE eight on that Mike to share model. Um, I'm like, we need to dial something back, but then we're, we're not going to progress because we're not doing enough work because obviously that's the number one thing. People are usually underworked in powerlifting. That's why they will see long-term regression or even long-term stalls is because the workflow that they're doing is not proper for their leverages or them themselves. Um, so when I monitor that intensity of that secondary day and it's too high, I will kind of uh, pull it back and see if throwing in an extra set or even a, an extra rep, like, dialing the entire day up a rep if it's under four sets or three sets i will but if it's over like five sets adding five reps that tonnage that overall tonnage is just going to be something that they might not recover from if they are a a six foot plus six foot one lifter so that's when i will almost make it an ascending model just because uh i found that lifters who are taller can recover from ascending models the best or even it keeps them dialed in longer because when they're doing that final set of the ascending model that's what they want they they almost want a reward um for hey i did this this day but in reality as a coach it's like we wanted to keep you dialed in so that that set the all the sets preceding that set would be um technically sound you would actually focus on them and actually go in with the mindset of, yo, this is a warm up for that top set almost. But in reality, it's just an ascending model to keep the relative intensity of that session down. Yeah. That, that's why I love ascending sets. Like I work on in those a lot for, for, for people who are just taller in general as on the secondary days. And that's probably what the most common programming strategies versus like, and then somebody else who's like, um, raw leverage just a little bit more straight sets. Like for me on deadlift, like I will still do like ascending sets, but like I've also had success with like, um, straight sets. Um, it kind of doesn't really matter too much for, for me. Just to ma mainly just to like make sure that their their top and intensity is is controlled, especially as they're you know a little, a little bit bit taller. Because obviously, if you're shorter, you can recover from that a little bit a bit easier. But I think the, the, like the topic of like um you know power for just being under underworked in general, a lot of people would be like, what is this, like how is that possible? But I think people like just create intensity um to like that workload too much because if you look at the overall volume it was like i, I do think tonnage matters like I, i've heard some people Absolutely. say they don't think it does but i'm like I, it does like this is a, this is literally like lifter response in my opinion is it is it as important as like we once you know maybe we, we thought no but it matters a lot because um tonnage needs to go up over time and in some way she perform in order for you to get stronger that's a byproduct of you getting stronger and some results of you getting stronger um you know i've been able to make very consistent progress on my like you know, i had a, actually this is one of the questions i had like earlier on in my powerlifting coaching career with my coach um and i was like when would we need to add like a set to like my squats yeah and he was like well if you're not getting stronger that's when you would add a set because your intensity is controlled right 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 now but as you're getting stronger your time is just going up and that's going to drive strength adaptations and you know, even on the topic of like, you know, just managing like that intensity progression, like just very small changes make a big, big difference um, in how a might feel from like their overall tonnage. Um, but that's sort of something that like, I don't track that necessarily, but like I, I keep my programming similar enough, right? Like, from my clients, I can look, I can look, look, look back and be like, oh, this is like, we've been doing, doing this for a long enough time. Like, I need to add a set here um, based on them, how they're feeling. Or maybe I need to add another day of, fre of fre frequency. And maybe it's a variation. Like for me, one of the biggest changes I made to my program is adding a third belt squat day. Because I'm like, I feel really recovered from my squats. I just don't feel, I don't feel good. I don't feel strong enough. And if I added two sets, sets, sets of squat, but it was a very non-specific, non-axial will be loaded movement so that I could recover from better to have more of that muscular priming effects that I was after. So, um, 
it's always really interesting like talking about like why the first stall out but like I, I do agree with you there um that's that, that's a big one then another one is like not prioritizing the long-term athlete development from like a muscularity standpoint specifically yes that's why uh i kind of have a i track punnage really really closely just because i think uh large spikes in punnage just lead to injury like when your lifter wants to constantly push themselves an extra set or you'll give them uh, an m rep which i i program m reps very very scarcely um just because that spike in in tonnage i found will lead to injury so um so i like to or maladaptation as... leading into the next block sorry like yes. or like mal or like mal it's like that's a big thing that i think a lot of people like don't consider is that if you have like like an rp10 at the end of like your of like your block you're going to maladapt into that block and you're going to have to have you know drop lighter and take bigger jumps to like or like recover so yeah. you can have or a even, decent next lot. Or even worse term, they'll have to uh deload in the middle of a macro cycle. It, yeah. It's probably <laughs> the worst injury I run into or not injury, the worst programming thing I've run into with teenagers is they want to push the doubles block. I don't know if you have other team members on your roster as well, but I find it's always doubles because triples the objective load is like so far away from their single that they can actually just have no ego and just push the triple to the prescribed RPE. But on doubles, I have found that every single teenager ever wants to push the double over their one RM or close to their one RM. And then yeah. when they get to their singles, it's like you you don't have any more you have no momentum. You have to deload. And now instead of creating a structure where you have two blocks full of momentum, you are now just four weeks. You have you have to PR off in four weeks of training, which is very possible, but when you're in a macro cycle sort of structure, it's better to PR off of three, 12 weeks of momentum, like opposed to four. Um, I think all lifters would agree when they're coming into a meat prep. Uh, like if you do a four week meat prep opposed to a 12 week meat prep, the person with 12 week meat prep is going to have better results just because they have longer time to adapt to all of that training uh, preceding the meat. And then that, that person who has four weeks only has four weeks. Yeah, one of the things I'll do there um, um, is something that uh, before, before we go on that, this is the last thing. So okay. sorry, I like to yap about, about this. Um, my friend Brendan and I we talk about like periodizing the top end intensity exposure, um, to actually create that momentum and like give like lifters like a, a cap, um, especially like 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 capping it like at eight at eight, and then we go to like a nine because if it's at eight, like you really have to like try to like go to RP ten. Anyways, so tonnage. that's kind of funny you bring that. That's kind of funny you bring that up. Before I get to tonnage, I've actually tried. A, I'm trying a model on uh, one of our lifters. His name Josh, uh, where he's he has undulating sets, uh, but it's going to be a three six block macro. He's going to have uh, the the blocks are going to be capped at RPE. So the first block's going to be RPE five, the second block's going to be RPE six, and so on. Um, but the sets are undulating, so he's hitting singles every single block. Um, but because that RPE is capped, he's going to create an like a very large adaptation um over time uh it's 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 already started to work uh for his first uh six block macro he he undulates the, the whole way down from fours to uh singles and he almost uh he lifts better in a prime state so like his single that he hit on his first block of the structure was like 20 kilos below his max so and that was on an rp5 um and then the, he's on the second block of his macro and we're planning to only go 10 kilos below his max with uh, an RP6. So what that will do is it's kind of uh, putting him on a set adaptation timing. So it's raising the, the floor. So in my system, I kind of have like a floor and a ceiling. So I kind of aim to raise the floor uh, over the ceiling. So the top, top end periodization is something I do do, but I kind of want to raise that floor or baseline of a lifter before I go and attack that top end when we're in the off season. Because if a lifter has a lower base or a higher baseline, then their top end could potentially be over where we actually place it when we uh, do see that fatigue kind of dissipate and we taper them up into competition because I have had lifters who I was like, your baseline's really high. You haven't hit a PR uh, on the peaking block where they missed the PR and then we tapered and it was like, okay, all of this fatigue like almost caused the craziest adaptation we've ever seen. I and mean, they hit something that um, we've never seen before or they've never done in the gym before. That's why training maxes I select based off of training. Some people select training maxes based off of what they do in a meet. I don't do that because I, I always specify that 
that meat numbers are meat numbers. There's there's training going into the meat that is done to create that almost not false sense of strength, but your your meat numbers are not going to be your training numbers nearly ever. Um, I I have never seen a lifter who can replicate top end strength like like they do on the platform. Uh, in training, like even I'm trying to think, like Anthony McNaughton, uh, McDouble Thick. He yeah. he uh, squats eight hundred plus in the gym, but then when he hits the platform at the at the Arnold, I was there. Um, it was r- a ridiculous squat that I've never seen him even attempt in the gym, and I think that's what a lot of younger lifters need to uh, figure out that their their top end strength, especially when they are very very young, they think that their top end strength is just going to be so crazy uh, over uh, what they do in training that it almost creates a false sense of reality when they get back to training and then they're like they structure off of something that's too aggressive and they're not peaked they're not tapered um and then they will run into intensity issues when they fizzle out right fully agree there oh okay and then back to tonnage (laughs) i kind of got a little tangent there um tonnage is something that i actually track i'm more toward the accessory tracking of tonnage because i have found in my system, obviously, it's very musculature based on benching uh, because, I mean, you've never seen a non-jack dude bench 405, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> but, um, when I see that the lifters' tonnage is kind of spiking up and down because there's some lifters who uh, come into sessions with, like, a lot of work stress, school stress, or, like, job stress in general, and they will sandbag their accessories. So I tell lifters before I add a top set, an extra top set of squat, what's an extra top set of squat going to do if you're not pushing your belt squat or your pendulum squat or your leg accessories? Because the the biggest thing that I find in, in lifters when they're like, oh, I'm not stalling, but you're pushing your accessories to an RPE six one day, and then you're spiking them up to a seven, like lifters oftentimes gradually don't ascend their tonnage throughout training, especially, uh, especially in uh, accessories, like for your accessory model, you're trying to push what five, 10 pounds every week. Yeah. I mean, as much as I can, honestly, like I, uh, I treat a lot of my success in powerlifting up to this point, just because I train really hard on my accessories. Yeah. So something that I have read into is there's some lifters who actually come into the gym, hit like, 80 pounds on like a lap pull down and then the next week they'll just jump to like 120 and i'm like dude you got you got to hit that pretty hard because you're going to have a gradual spike in your tonnage over time but you don't want that uh, tonnage spike to be week to week or that can even bleed into your right uh main compound movements because if you're spiking up your tonnage and then there are there are times where you'll look block to block and you'll be like you have it improved but they're like oh but i i just I just want to push my accessories on week four. That's not when you push your accessories. Obviously, you look to PR them on week four. But if you're pushing them week uh, weeks one through three of a block, you're almost creating a baseline for week four. So um, you have mentioned that non-prime pecs. And it's like someone who doesn't uh, machine chest press or my favorite combo of all time, weighted dips and weighted push-ups um, is something that I have found even is a something I swap in my bench system for a day four when someone doesn't have a lot of time or access to a competition fetch press um, just because it hits um, the areas of the chest that I want to from a musculature standpoint. And it also is something that creates a pretty large adaptation when someone pushes their weighted dips pretty hard. Um, they're usually a, a, a pretty large bencher. Like I'm like on average, when I've seen someone dipping three plus plates like Bob does, or I think Bob's like four or five plates now, he's benching 500 plus pounds. Um, it's one of those things where I found that the fatigue is almost equal to an inclined barbell press uh, is weighted dips. They're kind of equal in the fatigue spectrum I found. So that's something that I will track very, very uh, closely because if I see that the kind of spike over time is so large, they'll they'll end up getting hurt because i like when the model is not set or uh monitored well then that lifter will push that uh tonnage almost too much and then they'll run into some shoulder pain or some pec pain and then i'll be like oh but your your model of your accessories just is like a giant spike like almost like a stock graph if that makes sense uh because that lifter is pushed coming into the the session and they'll push it 50% one day and then we'll push it 110% the next day. And then they'll wonder like why their baseline is improving. And I'll be like, your baseline is improving over time. And it takes time to improve if you are putting in the effort to actually um, 
make sure those accessories are being pushed to the correct RPEs. I think that's why it's so important as a coach when you create a program, don't just send them the program and expect them like know what to do. Um, explain to them, this is how I want you to approach your competition work. This is how I want you to re approach your accessories so that you are getting the execution that you want and then ask them to send you videos so that you can see like what their effort's like. Um, but it's funny because Joe saw me like doing like my leg extensions and like my leg curls. Like when he was at, at, at the gym, he's like, okay, I don't need to worry about you ever. But you're, you're, you're totally <laughs> yeah. fine. Um, but I, I think that's, that's, that's a great thing because and, you know, Don is, is explained that every part of the program needs to be consistent for us to actually measure what's working and what's is not. Because if you're not measuring um, something consistently, it's very difficult to know, well, what do I actually need to change? Because it's kind of like, if I have a lifter who says, this chest doesn't suck. And I'm like, well, what were the variables going? And they're like, oh, I had like a protein bar and like 16 ounces of water. And I got like 20,000 steps all day. And yeah, man, I just, this is the worst. I, I just, I, 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 I just couldn't move like 85% of my max. I'm like, no shit, bro. <laughs> like, that's because you weren't, you weren't yeah. prepared or you weren't sleeping or, or whatever. And so, you know, there's a, there's a certain level of detail you need to have. And I do think that like the best lifters, they are very detail oriented. Um, because like, you know, or you and I both know this, like as coaches, um, our best athletes are very collaborative because they, they pay attention. Yes. They, they work hard. They are, obsessed with, with like getting, getting better. Um, and they ask like good questions and that's sort of what comes down to, you know, I think what separates people that see that consistent progress is like, you have to stay hungry. You have to stay interested in what you're doing. Cause like, as far as this past year has been for me and, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, I can be, be ready for a decent meet in, in November. The reason why I stayed so interested and I, I was really realizing this, why is this, why, like, why am I still doing this? I'm like, I find it fun to like just problem solve. I, I really like it. I think it's a lot of fun, like tracking all these little things. And like, if I change this, maybe this will happen. And then it's like, oh, but, but maybe what about this? And so, yeah, that's sort of why I stay invested in it. I think that's a lot of how the best lifters approach their training. Yeah, I mean, well, the best lifters, I think, view it more of a, like, they, they kind of view it stacking macro cycles. Whereas I think uh, very beginner and intermediate lifters view it as stacking blocks. So, I think the lifters who are the best right now is like Brenda Petrie, Bob, and Ashton, obviously. Um, they kind of view it in a model that Marcellus is in his macrocycle. They're like, oh, I'll stack the macrocycle now. They're not pushing, they're pushing their block ends, absolutely, uh, lifting ridiculous amounts of weight, but they, they recognize that the baseline of the block, so if you end the block at an eight and you PR, they're like, okay, that this is a minimal doses that I need to PR here, and then I'll almost spike it up next block, and then you can do this over time and that that'll create many adaptations that will kind of lead to keeping you into a, a window of almost never hitting diminishing returns. So you, you kind of want to do the same thing over and over and over again until training is almost monotonous to the point where it's just bland. Um, but that bland training is what is going to create the best power lifter uh, just because I mean, powerlifting is just a game of adaptations. What can make the, the lifter ad adapt to the same thing over and over and over again? Then how can you find it? Um, how can you find it the quickest? Because when you have a lifter who wants to constantly push, they'll, they might uh, burn an, an idea or a good microcycle out very, very quickly. Because when a lifter has to, uh, or a lifter wants to constantly push, they'll almost never be primed and ready for their week four because they'll obviously be very, very under recovered. And that's when low caps are a huge thing that come into role or come into play in my system. Everything from week one to three is capped just because I'll find on average lifters don't like to to raise the baseline themselves and they'll kind of view the baseline as just that that week. So like they'll be like, oh, I'll do well in week one. And then week two, they'll be like, no, you didn't do well in week one because you really sandbagged it and you, you're coming into week two almost under or over recovered and under stimulated. Um, and so that that's the huge thing I found uh, with how beginner and intermediate lifters view powerlifting training versus advanced lifters. It's really the lifter, uh, almost their skill set is determined by how they view the, the powerlifting structure of the training just because if you view it very long term you're not going to be upset over a bad week or a bad microcycle you're not going to be right. upset over a bad block because you know the you know the block is raising your baseline opposed to 
someone who's more of a beginner or immediate, they are going to view that block as the end of the world. And then they're like, oh, this block helped me raise my baseline. Even if you uh, hit a, 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 PR a PR match or a PR single at a relatively low RPE, and you're like, oh, it's only a two and a half kilo PR, um, that, that is still helping raise that workload capacity and helping you adapt to probably a heavier load down, down the line instead of cashing in uh, super, super early in a, in a training cycle and kind of staying more um, connected with the sport. Because if you are viewing more long-term, you're going to be more connected and training is going to sort of be a, be a better flow. You'll, you'll kind of have a bit like a flow state almost uh, in the terms of, Oh, I'll, know what you want to do at the end of every block sort of right no i i agree i agree with you you know this is boring and on paper but it's fun when you have like when you're like if i do this and i manage all my variables like this is likely going to be um the the, the result so don i want to thank you a lot for for coming on this is super super cool i'm just getting to hear some of your, your insights there like i said at the beginning um they're really really um unique so uh, if you want to follow you or hire you for coaching where should they head uh, I have an Instagram. It's uh, at the Dong Fine. Uh, I am currently uh, full on a roster right now, so I have a wait list in my bio. If people want to apply. Cool. I'll make sure that I include that uh, in the show notes. And thank you guys for listening. I'll talk to you guys in the next episode.